Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, today's lecture, we are going to cover privacy preservation machine learning. Uh, privacy is a very critical issue. I would talk about the reasons, regulations, approaches, and finally, one of the solutions uh, Stanford has implemented. Uh, before we get started, let's talk about this, uh, our presentation schedule. Uh, we have two uh, classes uh, open for sign up next Tuesday and the next Thursday. And uh, each presentation is expected to be about 30 minutes. So if you your time cannot accommodate to these uh, two uh, presentation epochs, we can accommodate uh, scheduling other time. But it should be before uh, the time we need to turn in the your grades. And also just a reminder, please uh, do cost evaluation. And this is uh, re reminding me by the register. Uh, we would like to really appreciate your comments, suggestions. So for the next edition, we can make improvement or basically what we have done right and what you expect us to improve, uh, let us know. And remaining lectures, today, again, we cover privacy preserving machine learning. And uh, this Thursday, and uh, we had covered already consciousness. And we are going to wrap up consciousness, get into mind and ethics. These are two very critical subjects, but at the same time, very abstract. But I plan to root on uh, psychology and uh, maybe physics. Right, to give you some of the perspectives from quantum mechanics and uh, maybe even from religion's perspective. Okay, today's outline, we are going to start cover the major concerns about privacy from user's perspective and also from uh, company's perspectives. And the uh, privacy regulations, the key regulations are CCPA and GDPR. And we plan to explain them in, in details. And also in the medical domain, right? We have we have uh, another set of regulations, but they are pretty similar. Uh, then from these compliance requirements, if we cannot comply as a company, then the company may be fined heavily. So we have to understand the compliance requirement and convert the requirement into execution requirements. And we must have heard about like federated learning or differential learning. Will those implementation fulfill the regulation requirements or not? I personally consider they are not adequate, but it's really hard to say until uh, a company and uh, was a company will be brought to the lawsuit situation. The court eventually will clarify uh, the boundary of the regulations. So we enumerate three major technical approaches to be able to preserve privacy, and finally. Uh, I mentioned it's a Stanford system called Solteria. It's called developed by, by Stanford and also my previous colleagues and use this blockchain to safeguarding privacy. So privacy, for sure, we know that they say using cell phone, using laptop, whatever information we enter, uh, we will be tracked, right? So there's a trade-off between free usage obligations and you have to give us something. And in certain situations, you, if you don't give up your information, the application cannot be run, like uh, Google Maps, right? Google Maps, you say, I want to opt out uh, location tracking, then good luck, uh, it just cannot be functioning. So, but other applications like uh, news. So I, I'm consulting a Japanese company right now, and they are worried about if they track your reading patterns, uh, what will be the regulation ramifications, right? So in certain applications, the yes or no, between yes and no, the boundary is, is kind of tricky. And the uh, self driving vehicle for sure, uh, it has been collecting tons of data. And uh, take Tesla as an example, if you see the fine print behind the vehicle, you can see uh, it collects your battery status, temperature inside, outside, your location. Also in this uh, level two, uh, self driving, they have to track the user's status, right? If a user is dozing off, they quickly they will just uh, turn off self driving mode. 
And all those information potentially where you are and uh, what is your conversation even in the car, uh, they will track. And for instance, if you are in, they say in some countries, you get into a taxi and everything uh, you, you kind of conduct in that taxi, in that space, uh, is not personal information, it's, it's, it's actually private. And uh, so, so when we talk about healthcare, we introduce this tricorder device with a number of uh, medical IOTs and all those information such as the walking pattern and uh, the, the ECG information on Apple Watch, right? Those data uh, is being collected and utilized. And uh, frankly, I have no idea who is using my uh, ECG data and uh, will Apple resell my data to other companies. Uh, at this point, I'm just totally clueless, right? So it would be nice to be informed what kind of data is being collected from me and uh, to, to which party the data will be sold. And uh, OVO, as part of OVO, Stanford OVO, we're doing this virtual assistant and virtual assistant will become more and more popular. Even you don't have a speaker, just talk to uh, your computer through Siri, uh, information is being collected. And all these uh, speakers, uh, suppose we turn them off, they are still sort of listening, right? Because they need to be, be waken up to perform their duties. So conversations at home uh, will be recorded. So one situation I got into this was about uh, a week ago. I went up to the dish and uh, I came home and I, I, I feel I feel my knees were hurting. So I, I, on the one hand, I'm searching for remedies for uh, healing my knees. At the same time, I also talked to my wife about the situation. And, and suddenly Facebook uh, prompted this uh, video to me. So that was very spooky, right? Uh, so this could be one of two situations. One was Facebook through uh, MacBook was listening to me. And the second thing is maybe I was typing something in real time, the information was transmitted to Facebook and Facebook do this kind of real time matching. So this is, uh, to me, it's a kind of horrible experience means, well, in real time, people can target me uh, or you can say, this is a blessing. I have this is a health, health concern and someone is really caring for me. So top consumer privacy concerns. So yes, I do have a lot of concern. And this is a survey uh, conducted by uh, some agencies and you can search all these kind of different surveys on the internet. So I summarized some key concerns. One is definitely identity uh, theft. Uh, it's not really changing these days. E even you say, I want to anonymize myself, uh, but still do cross -cor correlation. Uh, the, if people really want to target uh, you individually, they could get your uh, PI information, personal identifiable information. And the private data then will be made public. And this is really bad for especially politicians, even for us, right? It is not a glamorous, glamorous, glamorous situation. And data can be sold and distributed without our knowledge. And certain data, especially medical data, uh, could be valuable. So when data has been sold, uh, people will be willing to sell the data for revenue or for charity, but they'd like to know the fact the data has been used. And the safety, if my location can always be tracked, then if people want to uh, impose harm to myself, and uh, that, that's kind of uh, not a comfort, comforting situation. So let's uh, enumerate some details of CCPA and the G GDPR regulations. So GDPR was is established by uh, European Union, and CCPA was passed by California Congress uh, about two years ago, then uh, was become active uh, January 2020. And they gave all the companies some grace period to implement it. And uh, currently, as I, if, if my information is not obsolete, means if a consumer asks for certain privacy related actions, uh, to be conducted by the company, let's say you erase my access history, the company has to respond in about three months. So because the regulation was just 
uh, was just out there last year. So therefore, they gave this long grace period for all the companies to get their act together. And uh, recently, when you access certain sites, you started to get a pop-up like, can I use your cookie? Can I track your cookie? And so on and so forth. Those are pretty much because of a CCPA. And uh, lawyers agree, CCPA, although was initiated in California, but will be widely adopted by other states very, very soon. So like I mentioned, uh, CCPA started last year. And uh, some terms, let's uh, define them. So when we discuss uh, the, all the implementations, we will we'll be on the same page. So here we, we say person, person we talk about uh, jurisprudence, uh, nature person, just like a person with, with a body uh, with temperature, right? It's not like a, a business, business kind of unit. Uh, so personal information, it defined by information that can identify or relates to, describes, is reasonable, capable of being associated with a real person. Okay. So this kind of personal information could include my address, IDs, and uh, several other things. And we talk about more uh, in, in later slides. And then to store the data, matching data, we divide the people into uh, kind of three, two or three categories. One is the people need to manage data, right? Data, we call data subject. And the data controller, uh, it's a person who determine the process of managing the data and set up the SOP, standard operation process for processing data. And data processors are, are the people who are instructed by data controllers to process the data. So basically you have controller and processor, they play uh, different roles, okay? And uh, PI, personal information, is divided by uh, a few categories. One is personal information strictly prohibited to disclose, including a person's religion, genetics, biometric, health, healthcare data, and IDs. And uh, they, they are, there are more. And some data, uh, they are anonymized, right? So suppose you have a database storing a person's name and then all the personal information plus their access history. Access means I say I access a news uh, website. The access history will be all the news I have read in the last, say, let's say, say several weeks. So you like to be able to anonymize not really the access patterns, but my PI, personal information, need to be anonymized. And uh, another category is pseudo-anonymized. So even let's say you anonymize my record, but still using some mechanisms, I can still uh, re-engineering or re-identify that, that person, right? Uh, I will give an example shortly. So basically, suppose I have your address and uh, that's very, very simple. I have your gender and, and then maybe your working location. Maybe it's not too hard to pin down uh, your identity, even not yourself per se, but can profile you into a specific group. So this is an example. Uh, suppose you have uh, data stored by, let's say, Facebook or Google, and uh, they need to worry about two things. One is how to store data. And uh, the second thing is how the data will be accessed, right? And the storage, because when you store data, data will be used. So how the data gets stored can affect privacy. So let's say you have your uh, database table, which consists of personal information. And uh, like I mentioned, some access history, you have to separate the two into two tables then do, do a join. And the only data controller can see both tables. And the data processor can only touch on uh, the table with only data, pad, uh, data history, but without PI information, okay? So you kind of reduce the number of people who can touch uh, PI information. And uh, oh, even let's say data controller can access PI information and all the accesses must be locked and lock on indelible record 
for future audit. So here, one important point uh, sticks out is indelible record for audit. And uh, the auditing process must be transparent and must be uh, trusted. And all the actions done by this DC and also need to be provable, right? So you say, yeah, I did it. I did this and that, but that's your verbal claims. But when FCC audits a company, they want to see provable evidence. So privacy governance and the policy clearly written to cover the following. So I will talk about uh, G GDPR and CCPA separately, but they are very similar. Only about one or two items, uh, they, they, are, they have slight differences. So the policy clearly written, uh, just sent to the user, user need to consent. The policy has to cover what data the site collects from the user and the collection method mechanism, how data will be used and uh, what the user will receive as, a, as an exchange, right? So for example, you're, you would get, give more accurate ads as an exchange. Whether you like it or not, you can make a decision and uh, where the data is being stored and uh, where the data be shared and shared with whom. So this required information must, must be stated in, in the privacy policy. And uh, some consent must be explicitly be given by the data subject. And you cannot just say, I give you this policy with 10 items. And then you say, well, you have to agree with either all or nothing. So the key thing here is that by default, all the items will be opt out. And uh, we have to itemize each collected data item separately. And then we, there's no bundle agreement. And uh, the user has to, to click each one of them to say, either I accept your collection of my data, collecting my data or not, right? So no box uh, can be pre-checked and the option is up out and the user can come in to select the items they feel comfortable about and they can always come back to uh, about, okay? So everything has to be done explicitly, that's a key. So unlike currently, uh, many, many consumer activities, you will be given a, a huge or, or, or huge, huge deck of documents and uh, you, you are required to sign, to finish signing within 10 or 20 minutes, right? Especially let's say you uh, buy a house or you even buy a car and uh, the contract agreement, a few pages and uh, you just cannot see all the details of or fine prints within uh, the the pressure timing. Okay, the second uh, information piece is specifically cover uh, GDPR, it's European regulations. And uh, the consumer has right to right of inform, right? Any data uh, being assessed must be, be told. And the right of access must be granted by the user. And right, the user has right to erase, to be forgotten and right of data portability, if I want to move my data from hospital A to hospital B, B you, you cannot say no, you have to let me do it. Right to restrict data processing and right to object. And data processing can, you, you, can, you can even be very specific saying, okay, my gender information or my age information uh, should not be revealed. Right to uh, rectification may means I can make changes to my personal information and right to reject automated individual decision-making or profiling or even as targeting. And CCPA, as I said, uh, the Bill of Rights are very similar to GDPR, except for two items. So I highlight in, in red. The first here is know whether their personal data is sold or disclosed, and if so, to whom, okay? And GDPR didn't say that specifically, but CCPA is saying, well, if your data has been sold, you have to tell the, the owner explicitly. And this is probably because of the, the, uh, a few uh, problems happened in, in the past years. And uh, I have uh, some examples to show you uh, shortly. 
And the final one is, is a little bit dicey. It's called not to be discriminated. And uh, I couldn't understand it until uh, the, the, the company Smart News and try to implement the privacy uh, rules. So, so Smart News in, in the initial is saying, well, our privacy data uh, stored in the back, back end is very convoluted. So if we really need to be in compliance, then we have to uh, redesign the database schemas. We have to do this the data uh, unloading, reloading. This will take some time. So why don't we do a shortcut? We just tell the users who opt out this uh, kind of access data agreement. We just say, okay, sorry, you cannot use the, our application anymore. And uh, basically in, they install them, they install their applications from their phone or from their desktop. And from CCPS perspective, you cannot do that because this means you are discriminating certain uh, users. They are not waiting to let you collect their data. But why this is very kind of dicey because suppose uh, in the situation of Google Maps, right? So you say, okay, I'm not going to allow you to track my location. So you say, oh, then I cannot give you uh, driving direction that's not really discriminating against you. That's I cannot serve you because I don't have certain information about your your situation. There's no way I can give you uh, a reasonable prediction of your of your next driving uh, direction. So another scenario, you can say the opposite. Let's say I have this application. I want to charge you for let's say subscription fee ten dollars a month, but if you allow me to access your data, then it's free. So then, then this, if you if you have this kind of kind of uh, offer, then it's hard to say whether you are discriminating against the user or not, right? So all these kind of boundary conditions uh, we can interpret right now, but eventually will be interpreted by the law of the core of the law. So finally. Uh, a very subtle point, but it's extremely critical is, uh, I'm not going to read this at all details. The critical thing is you have to be able to write all your privacy safeguarding actions somewhere. And eventually your actions have to be provable. So I'll give you an example. They say person X requested company Y to erase his or her private consent via email. And company Y did not fulfill the request, and but claim they claim that they have done uh, the request, right? So you say, okay, erase my data. I say, oh, I did it, but actually they did not. So how can you prove it? And you can get into this uh, he says, she says situation. That would be very convoluted. So the law requires the company has to be able to prove they have done all the processes to safeguarding. The user's privacy. So let's come back to talk about probability in the end. And these are some landmark cases of privacy policy violation and the consequences. On the top row, you see in the beginning or uh, maybe a couple of years ago, uh, Uber was fined for 148 million by EU. So the top line was a violation of uh, GDPR. And uh, then there was a two, $230 million fine uh, from British Airway. And uh, the re most recent one was uh, FTC versus Facebook. And Facebook was fined by $5 billion. And uh, the bottom is a course, is, is a case happened just last year. Uh, FTC uh, brought a lawsuit against Google YouTube and uh, Google YouTube did not send consent to children's parent for accessing children's data, right? So this is also kind of complicated because for minors, uh, they don't have, even they say, well, I agree, you collect my data, but they don't really have, they don't, they don't have a sufficient uh, ability to make such a judgment. So the consent should be sent to parents. Uh, then this was, uh, Google was fined by $170 million. So a, a very uh, tricky situation here was some company, they will say, okay, I get fined by 
uh, FTC or some agencies for millions of dollars. But on the other hand, because of the information, I can earn a billions of dollars. So for some company, they will say, well, uh, this is cost of sales. I, I don't know whether you have heard about this term or not. Um, like uh, one example I can provide is uh, uh, like Google used PageRank in the beginning, and then they do this uh, ad words, right? If you, you can buy words on search terms on, on Google. And the patents of AdWords was owned by a European company. So if you implement it without licensing, then you'll be fine having it. Uh, but if you want to license it, then there's a cost. So how can you deal with the situation, right? So that's, when that happens, that's a consideration of say, yeah, let me, let me just violate it. If uh, it's, it's not working, then I just, uh, doing this kind of uh, disagreement or dispute, I can just drop it. But if I make huge profit about it, then I, I can just pay the fine because at the end I'm earning more than 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 lose my my loss. So that was very uh, that kind of act was very non-ethical, but it's it's actually in practice. Okay, now we want to say you talk about all these compliance requirements. How can we implement it? And be very careful. Uh, there are many methods presented out there, but always on my one, even a policy has been implemented, can private private information still be uh, re-identified or people can do reverse engineer to find out who you are or which group you belong to, right? So that's one thing to consider. The second thing to consider is again, the provability. And, and trust, right? So you say you had done that, but prove me uh, how did you do it and when did you do it? So the execution to comply consists of uh, five steps. One is you have to delegate an oversight committee in a company. So this is just not saying, say I have done that. So when FTC audits a company, my previous company was audited by FTC. So when they came in, they say, hey, give me all the documents to show you do have an oversight committee who they are. And these people do exist. Okay. And they they map the data you have collected to your usage and storage. So where do you store the data? Can you show us the document and how the data has been used? So it's definitely hard for F FTC to really gain to your database to look around, but they want to see documentations. And then do you have this SOP for your employees, right? So all the regulation we talk about, do you have this compliance process for your data controller and also data processors? If frankly, you don't even have a process in place, then everything is just talking. And uh, do you have your personnel divided into DC and the DP? and also specifying their roles very clearly, right? And uh, SOP for serving consumers, when consumers is served, did you really give them uh, this kind of contract to sign? So allow them to opt in and opt out and uh, comply with all these required uh, items. And finally, provability. Uh, let's look at the technique, technical approaches. So the first one is very, uh, understandable. You say, I just anonymize the data, right? Then we have this differential privacy was popular before CC, uh, CCPA uh, was activated. And the federated learning is still very popular. And Google was, was pushing that, uh, pushing this, back, this, this, this effort. And quite a few papers have been published uh, on this particular subject. Then finally, uh, talk about distributed ledgers. So, Anonymized versus pseudo anonymization, uh, there are some subtle differences. So anonymization means if I even I look at the, the, the data or a SQL table, I have no idea who is that particular person. So basically you just hide all the personal identifiable information, right? So including as I said already, your gender, your profession and so on and so forth. So, but 
even let's say data has been anonymized, uh, still could be re-engineered to find out who is a person. For instance, uh, let's say cell phone would track my locations. So it knows in the daytime, I will be in certain location around Stanford. So for sure, I think uh, the Google Maps will say, oh, Edward is affiliated with Stanford University and he lives in Palo Alto, right? And uh, from the duration I stay in a particular location, they say I stay in the Gates building, but I'm not moving around very frequently. I mean, at one spot for more than one hour. So easily to infer, well, maybe you are not a student because a student will be moving around to different classrooms, but maybe you are a staff or a faculty member, right? So if you say, oh, every, every other days, you will show up at a particular building and for about one hour and a half, now I say, okay, it's more likely you are a professor rather than a staff. So see, you have not really disclosed any information explicitly. You only have this person's moving patterns, but already you got lots of information from this person, right? And the, another example is on Facebook, you say, I'm not going to give you any of my personal information, including my birthday and, and uh, where I live. But for, unfortunately, if you have your social networks and you are interacting with people, uh, about 20 some years old, and they are college students, and most of them are from UCLA, it's not really hard to infer you should be in, in high probability, you are a UCLA student, right? Then with other information probably not stored in that particular app, then people can identify you. So because I'm in this uh, uh, news business, uh, you know, when you do ads targeting, if you just use the uh, users, news data itself. So I, I was joking with our engineers. I say, well, I, I read uh, election news. Let's say I'm either pro-Republican or pro-Democrats. Just based on either I go to CNN or Fox News, can you target me with ads, right? This is just ridiculous. If I, I'm a Democrat, do you sell me Tesla or do you want to sell me Ford? It, it's not very clear, so I say, well, news data, news reading history, using those to target ads, is kind of ridiculous. But then all companies will buy information, data information from browsers, from other sources. And uh, the Facebook information I just gave you, I was doing a search on Google. I was not doing a search on Facebook. I, I would never do a, a search on Facebook saying, oh, my knee hurts, what should I do? I did a search on Google, but how come? Facebook will pop up this particular ad, right? So somewhere someone was collecting information, then they aggregate all information from all different apps, maybe through the browser or somewhere, uh, then they, they aggregate and they target myself. So if you just look at one application, you may say, oh, I'm very safe, no problem. I Virtually about everything. But when they collaborate with uh, some other applications, then maybe RPI will be identified. So there are many horrible scenarios you probably can uh, find on the internet. Uh, if a person really want to target you, find who you are, uh, it's not impossible. So, so a basic practice is as, as following. Uh, like I say, if you have a, a consumer's data, right? You want to say, I want to separate the data into two relational, relational database tables. And in one table, I can store his or her name and the personal uh, information or personal identifiable information and then have a hash ID. Then using this hash ID, I can join another table. The key will be hash ID, unique hash ID, or you want to say maybe the hash ID may not mean to be unique. So that's another way to make sure the data, uh, you cannot target to one person, maybe just a group of person. Then hash ID uh, has then indexed to non-PII information. So the table, this second table can be accessed by a data processor. If they look at the table, they look at hash ID, they look at all this non-PII information, they are fine. 
they are not able to be able to identify who is doing what, right? Only data controller, oh, he or she can join two tables to know, oh, this person with this hash ID is Edward. So Edward has uh, accessed uh, Facebook and Google in the last few days. So this is a very primitive way of uh, trying to be compliant, but, but for sure, it's not really in fully compliance. So the second method is differential, differential uh, privacy. This was proposed by uh, professors in uh, Hong Kong, uh, UST. Uh, the idea was, I don't really need to separate your PI from your uh, his SS history, but I just need to introduce noise to the data, right? In this example here, uh, on the top, you see, you have a very specific information about person, including office in, in London, department IT, date joint, 2015 and share information and so on and so forth, right? If you get a hold of this 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 piece of information uh, in a company, you, if you work in a company, you see this. It's probably not 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 very challenging to infer who is this person. So you say, okay, I'm going to try to uh, introduce noise. So rather than London, I say well UK and uh, uh, they joint. I wouldn't want to specify the the month, just the year, then the day of birth, I specify and then maybe just a decade or an epoch of time. But still, this is not fully proof. So, but in theory, uh, differential privacy is attractive because they can come up with a quantifiable method to safeguarding privacy. And uh, you can see the formula is in the middle of the screen. The idea here, there are two uh, parameters one is this uh, uh, sigma parameter. So they have this sigma algebra. The sigma algebra is, I'm going to introduce introduce to your data certain noise, right? So uh, for a particular field, we already seen, you say, well, I'm going to apply this uh, uh, age expansion or uh, birthday kind of anonymize your year, but we put your day and month over there, this kind of algebra. And uh, then they have these privacy parameters, right? They say, well, it's just like a nearest neighbor search. And so last time we covered a nearest neighbor, but we didn't finish. We continue next time was when you do a nearest neighbor search, you don't get just yourself, you get a group of people. So then you say, I cannot really pin you down as a particular person in that group. So this is this epsilon means. You can introduce this epsilon. And uh, then there's a trade-off here for the company to decide. You see the left hand side, the trade off is, oh, private, private my privacy metric. So you want to safeguarding privacy, then the epsilon value need to be very small. But if you say, well, I don't quite care about your policy, I care about uh, utility. Sorry, it's the other way. If you want to safeguarding privacy, epsilon value need to be large. So when you want to, when, when the information is given, you, you, want, you identify actually a lot of people, not just a small number of people. So it's hard to pin down one individual. And by the same time, it's utility metric. So if I get a whole bunch of people here, then this application, suppose I want to do, uh, do a search, I want to do information dissemination recommendation, then my accuracy, right? The application's target performance metrics will suffer. And for any company which needs to generate revenue, the revenue for sure will go down. So the question here is very, very simple. Uh, privacy, it's possible to be implemented, right? So you say my privacy regulation is very loose and comply with privacy uh, eventually can be uh, kind of enhanced, but I'm going to lose a lot of revenue. Would the company do that? Or would they try to do any kind of uh, circumvention to pre prevent compliance. So this is a, a real problem. And uh, that's the reason again, provability becomes important. So let's come back to look at this differential privacy and depends on how large the epsilon you want, want it to be. The privacy can be a local privacy or a global privacy. Local privacy means, okay, I have a small group of people. I just want to implement this uh, uh, sigma algebra so magically, 
alter their private data. Then I have an aggregator, and eventually I can uh, store the data. But I can make my privacy uh, slightly more global, it means I have an aggregator. I already aggregate information from a large number of users, let's say female or male. Then I use a, a magic formula to alter them, right? So then I have this anonymized output. And because the input is a group of people, so it's much harder to track back to individuals. So when you combine both, right? Suppose I say, well, your private data, uh, individual data, I'm going to do a shuffling. And then I do another layer. I analyze the, the shuffling results and applying even more magic, then I really anonymize every, everyone. So, so the question is, let's say the, the final method is probably the most secure one, but it probably provides uh, the, the, the business uses the information to make their profit, right? So again, this is a, a big trade-off situation. So people are trying to uh, do this differential privacy, uh, then I think it's kind of uh, dying out. Uh, it's really hard to prove to a, an auditor saying, this is my epsilon, this is my sigma, so uh, this, is, this is the way I conduct the business and I prove in theory this will work. But no, you cannot prove. Everything is done empirically. And the, the, even you show the empirical data and who can trust your empirical data. So Harvard published this uh, interesting article. It's interesting, but it was not very sound. Basically, uh, this paper saying, well, you, you did your uh, uh, differential uh, or pseudo anonymization on the data, but we can re-engineering, re-identify the users, right? So the experiment they, they did was they get uh, about 300 users data from the, the medical databases. Then they say, well, everyone was anonymized. So let's start to add additional information. Let's say uh, zip code and date of birth and so on and so forth. At the end, they say, well, we can identify accurately about 90% of people. So I really, I mean, I understand this is a kind of a, a interesting result showing the more personal data you know about a person, you can more accurately infer who the person is, but this is no brainer, right? So the, the challenge to me was, if you only have 300 pieces of information, then you claim you can identify a person 95%, accurately, I think it's an easy problem. But if you enlarge your pool from three, 300 to 3 million, and I bet even with a zip code, uh, they, uh, you, you cannot do that. And if you have day of birth here, frankly, uh, even, even with 1 million people, the accuracy can still be quite high, right? So I respect the paper, but the paper itself didn't really tell me uh, any promising or exciting methods. So federated learning. It started from 2017. Google uh, wrote a paper and also a, a blog introduced the method. The method is very logical. So we all have our devices, uh, our laptop or cell phone and whatever personal devices. And uh, we don't send our private data to the app, to the, to the cloud. So all data mining, all this kind of machine learning will be conducted on the phone, right? So after the machine learning has been conducted, a model has been learned on the phone, then the model will be sent to the cloud. And the cloud or this centralized system then will aggregate all the information and develop a global model. And the global model will come back in return, come back to this target individual cell phones. So on the one hand, this is uh, kind of attractive. On the other hand, it also introduces arrows to the classification. And not only introduces arrows, but there could be other problem. Let's say, what kind of information you aggregate? Suppose I own the Android system and or iOS. So the amount of data I collected is not just from one application, I actually collect data from 
all different applications. So as I as an example I gave you uh, a few minutes ago, this is even more dangerous than getting all information from one application, right? One particular application. But you get all information, you get information from, from all applications, then you do uh, kind of coll collaborating among them. And the, the kind of information you can collect is just totally horrible. And okay, let's look at healthcare as one example. Suppose I have a, a deep neural net and uh, this picture shows there are multiple layers, attention layers and so on and so forth. And uh, the idea of this federated learning is, I'm going to cut off these uh, multi-layer new neural networks into two parts, right? So my animation doesn't work, but actually the key thing is in the middle here, let's say I draw a line in the middle here. Okay, okay, actually this picture will show. So I have four hospitals, each has been training the model based on their, let's say, X-ray data. They want to do this CT scan or maybe lung disease uh, classification. So each hospital have collected certain data, then run their own training algorithms. And then I say, okay, I'm going to cut your uh, neural net into a half. So the top half, so you learn in the middle, then I say, stop don't continue learning, just ship me all the model parameters. Then you say, okay, I'm going to continue learning here in my center database. So you guys stop learning, I'm going to aggregate, right? So at the bottom here, you show, this is a central centralized continuous learning and getting parameters from all different sites. And uh, this method seems to be uh, reasonable, but, but there are clearly, uh, two shortcomings from medical perspective. The first shortcoming is, as Andrew Ng said, every hospital may collect data using different process, different devices, or even same device, same device with different process or calibrations. So when you aggregate the parameters in this subsequent model, uh, those parameters may not agree with each other. And that could problematic because each other will become uh, your noisy disturbance rather than trying to help you. So for the test data, that could be this method could be productive because test it a test is a test. But for imagery, this pipeline may not be able to improve your accuracy. And and in practice, I, I see these kind of methods. Um, it's really hard to be realized. Because no hospital here would trust other hospitals. Every hospital consider their own data to be, to be a piece of gold. They don't want to share with others. So only perhaps in, on Android phone or on iOS, this federated learning can be conducted. But for healthcare, I have a really strong doubt, okay? So problem solved. And uh, I don't think so. And the two key problems, one already enumerated, which is the trade-off between privacy safeguarding and the utility to the company or revenue of the company. Right? This is always an ethical problem. And uh, a company, uh, uh, IPO, post-IPO company, they have obligation to their shareholders and the CEO is under tremendous pressure to perform. So I don't know where the, the CEO would draw the boundary. The, the second challenge is provability, right? You can claim anything, but CCPA now requires a company to prove. So this again, this is the picture to summarize regulations, but at the end on the right-hand side is you should be able to trust the company and uh, the company has to be able to prove their results and the policies. So let me spend the remaining time to introduce Sauteria. Sauteria is, is a goddess of Greece. It's kind of providing uh, individuals safety. And uh, the basic idea is we want to lock everything, including user consent, user uh, revocation. And uh, so all the consumers actions on their data and all these uh, actions conducted by the company, basically, 
need to be hardened on a ledger. And this ledger, if you want to be able to be people to trust the ledger, this ledger needs to be open, transparent to the public. So anyone can audit the ledger. If I say, no, 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 this is a centralized system. This is the bank's ledger. So you can, I, I'm going to log everything, but sorry, I cannot allow you to come in to see the details because I don't want you to see other people's account balance. Then this is a ledger which is not transparent and cannot bring people's trust, okay? So transparency is the key. So that leads to uh, the centralized and versus decentralized system. The centralized system by the name basically saying all the data, all the synchronization is conducted by one unit, right? Let's say a central bank or all the banks in the US, uh, they have this uh, bank, the, the headquarter bank and all information need to be synchronized with the headquarter. So when a, a bank want to close their books every day, they have to synchronize uh, from the center to all the distributed uh, bank bank branches to try to reconcile their, their books. And decentralized means all individuals can, can communicate with each other and uh, you can do local decisions, but eventually uh, we need to be able to reach global agreement, okay? So, <clears throat> We come back to see an example. This is a centralized banking system, uh, deposit, withdraw, and so on and so forth. Let's say I have two ATMs. I am using two ATMs. From one ATM, I deposit money. The other ATM, I withdraw money, right? So the, the important thing is you need to be consistent. You cannot say, well, before my deposit goes in, I already withdraw my money. So I have this kind of, I kind of double deposit, whatever this kind of seizure scenario. And in a, in a Bitcoin situation, they want to safeguarding a double spending, right? You say, I want to use my Bitcoin to buy $10 of uh, goods in, in, in one company or one store, you use the same Bitcoin to buy another thing. So there's a window about uh, 30 minutes for a Bitcoin transaction to be committed. Within the 30 seconds, uh, a person can double spend and that problem has to be closed, right? So. But Bitcoin is a decentralized problem. It's much more challenging than a centralized problem. But centralized problem bank is one example. And another example can be hospital. So you say, okay, I'm going to perform certain process on a patient. The information will be stored in the hospital, but eventually the information had to be, to be sent to who? Sent to a payer, right? Sent to an insurance company. So insurance company uh, pays the bills and they pretty much aggregate all the data together, they have all hospitals data. And uh, this is pretty much universal. In Canada, they have a uh, universal healthcare run by the government. The government has to pay the bills. So the government has all the healthcare records of the Canadian citizens. <clears throat> now, again, the question is trust. If you have a centralized system, how can I trust you? Because you are not going to reveal me all the actions you have conducted. So. We like to be able to have a decentralized system. So decentralized system, the question then will be, you have certain inconsistency that will happen. You have <clears throat> local agreement, but globally may not be agreeable. So therefore, uh, consensus protocols need to be executed. So consensus protocol can be separated into two camps. One is distributed consensus. You could have local consensus, eventually you uh, converge to global consensus, or you just have a centralized consensus protocol. And centralized con consensus protocol has been out, out there for many, many years because bank, banks or airline reservation systems have been out there for more than two decades, right? Uh, for airlines, airline reservation systems. And uh, when they started about even 20, 30 years ago, uh, even today, they haven't been able to really changing the system because it's just too many agents try to access the database and any modification to the system uh, run into the risk of uh, data corruption. <clears throat> so we not get into all these protocols in, in details because we want to stay in a, in a high level. And the Stanford has courses to cover uh, the detailed methods. And uh, when I was back in the CS department 20 years ago, there was a database course, then there was a 
transaction processing course. And the transaction processing course will cover all these uh, protocols to safeguarding agreement. So let me just give you an example. This is a rudimental consensus protocol called two-phase commit protocol. So I have uh, my participants, right? And uh, eventually I need to make a decision. So let's say I want to have a consensus we in a class to say, when are we going to do our, this is hypoth hypothetically, when are we going to do our final exam? And then I send, send out uh, two dates. One is uh, next Tuesday, another one next Thursday. Then uh, students start to vote, right? So once I get all the votes, I say, okay, majority of people vote for Thursday. So I will say, I will return back to you to say, okay, now I'm prepared to com commit because our rule is majority wins. And uh, then the decision in the decision phase, the student will say, yeah, I was I was saying Tuesday I prefer, but now the kind of a majority decision is Thursday, so I'm going to, okay, commit. I'm going to decide to commit. So you have second phase of communication. So in the two-phase commit protocol, here you see the overhead is the number of messages going back and forth to reach consensus. And uh, if the number of participants is small and you have this uh, kind of centralized system, and the cost is linear to the number of participants, right? Say I have 10 students and maybe the message will be sending back and forth 40 times because there are two way messages for each phase. But then when you say I want to do a global but decentralized kind of commit protocol, then the cost will be much, much higher, will be N squared, right? So everyone has to be able to talk to everyone in, in the most general situation. And this is not affordable. Then you say, well, on the one hand, I want to be transparent. I want each person to be able to make their kind of own decision. They can look at other people's data. But on the other hand, I have this kind of enormous cost. How can I mitigate or I do the reasonable trade-off? Then the trade-off, easy to understand here is, I'm not going to talk to, to everyone. Although I want to do a decentralized system, but I'm going to talk, talk to just a group of people, right? A group of people who I can trust. They say, I, when I want to make a commit decision, or when I say, I want to sell my medical data record to Sahil. And uh, this agreement only need to be approved or been seen by, let's say, AAA, uh, Bank of America, and maybe Tesla. Only three, because why? I don't think they together have any interest to con conspire together to kind of hurt me, right? So I say, okay, that's good enough. Three participants to vote for yes, and I can move on. And so this is a kind of compromise, but also reasonable, right? But if you say I'm going to randomly select uh, a few, then the situation will be much more dicey. So just slightly talk about the Bitcoin situation. Bitcoin is entirely decentralized. And they say, oh, if two thirds of people are voting saying your transaction is hard, so just, 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 just an example, or uh, when they start to build new blocks, right? So when a new blocks has been granted, has been committed, they have this the kind of longest block uh, will win now this condition. So you have a block which is six blocks longer you have a chain which is six blocks longer than the other chain, then all the previous blocks will be hardened or will be granted or be committed. But this will take some time, right? And uh, they don't actually identify who are the people who can make a block uh, committed. So it's like racing, you have to solve a puzzle. And uh, when a large number of people solve a puzzle, then the block is kind of hardened. And, uh, so who can solve the puzzle is random. And let's say even you say two third or one half, the people in this two third and one half, one, half, one half pool, they are random. You don't know whether they can be trusted or not trusted. So eventually, you know, uh, some powerful uh, kind of resource company, they actually can hack down a Bitcoin because they can own the majority of GPU in the world and they can be the majority of this kind of voting scenario. Right. So 
instead of doing that kind of so uh, expensive computation, why not just saying, oh, I'm not going to send to 1 billion people. I'm going to get these 10 people, right? Uh, these 10 people have conflict of interest with each other. If they so, or say yes, then that's fine with me. So that's pretty much the idea be, between a centralized, decentralized, and decentralized, you have this N square uh, messaging cost. And N square messaging cost is huge because you know IO is much more expensive than CPU or GPU time, computational time. So that would just grind your system to a halt. Again, the trade-off will be, okay, I'm not going to talk to N. I'm going to, going to talk uh, just a small subset of N. So this decentralized uh, picture shows the trade-off between cost and the trust, between transparency, again, and the trust. And uh, there are so many different protocols recently got proposed to be able to achieve a very good compromise between the two. So what do I say good compromise? Really depends on the application's objective. Okay. I can, again, give you a couple of examples shortly. So consensus versus transparency. In the privacy situation, uh, all the actions like what kind of data I allow the uh, consumer uh, to be uh, processed by the, by, the, by the business and uh, the contract opt-in, opt-out information, rectification, all the information need to be transparent to the public so can be audited. And uh, using blockchain to solve the problem, first of all, let's quickly identify the structure of blockchain. So a chain of blocks, let's say uh, H is the height, means I have H individual blocks. And every block may consist of a number of transactions, right? In the transaction is in the sense of bank, it's straightforward deposit and uh, maybe withdraw, or I look at my account history, in the case of privacy, every transaction is like, oh, user, a, the con a, user A's consent, user B's revocation, and uh, uh, business A access user B's data, right? Those are the transactions upon your data subject will all be logged on the blockchain. So this is one example uh, in one single block of the chain, and the transactions are organized uh, into a Merkle tree. So the characteristic of Merkle tree is if you change one of the leaf and then the hash value in the Merkle tree will be modified. So why we call this indelible? Because no one can come here to hack your data. If someone did, then the hashing value will be mismatched and uh, we can identify. And then this is like a binary tree, eventually going up to the top and uh, we have this root hash which is utilized to authenticate this block is not contaminated. Then this block has a, a hash index to the previous hash block. So when we in, in the index all together, you can see the blockchain has a number of blocks. They are linked together with this kind of previous, uh, previous hash address. And every block has a, a number of transactions organized in this Merkle tree. And it's very evident why you only have a pointer to the previous block, because you have no idea when you establish a block, you have no idea when the next block will be, will be established. Okay. So key requirements here, I'm not going to repeat transparency and the privacy and probability. So now, now let's, add, let's add step back to see how the blockchain can be utilized e efficiently. Because I talk about Bitcoin and you know Bitcoin very well, it's the problem is, is latency, right? It, latency of Bitcoin means I need to trust a transaction, but I need to wait for about uh, half an hour. Because unless the transaction, uh, the, the, the block which the transaction resides get committed, and in addition, that particular block resides in a blockchain which has a length, six more blocks than the second longest one, then I would say, okay, my transaction has been hardened and this will take half an hour. And this is a pretty long time. If you want to do this half an hour transaction, then payment is impossible. You do payment, you go to Starbucks, you say, I'm going to use, use 
blockchain to pay my bill, the commit time is uh, six hours. So I think Starbucks wouldn't accept your payment. So like privacy or like uh, currency, if you want to use this kind of uh, Bitcoin methodologies, something has to change. And uh, this is the way we did it. So before we get into detail, let's look at this Eric Brewer's CAP theory. CAP, C-A-P, C stands for consistency. So data viewed by different parties need to be consistent in the same order, right? It's like I withdraw and I, I, I deposit. Other people look at the record, they want to see withdraw deposit, they want to see the other way, then you have this inconsistency problem. Availability is another one. You want the system to be up all the time. So this is like the cell phone networks. So if, if, my, if I shut down my cell phone now, it shouldn't affect your, your cell phone, right? It's very easy to understand because you want your cell phone to be available, not depending on other people's cell phones. And the partition tolerance, and uh, in the banking system, partition tolerance is not allowed. But in our cell phone scenario, general network scenario, internet, partition tolerance should be allowed. Otherwise, if my laptop is done, your laptop needs to be in a standby mode. That's not acceptable. So if we look at this picture, then we say, well, in the internet era, if we want to do a distributed system, there's one property we cannot sacrifice, right? Which is partition tolerant. Okay, we have to safeguarding this uh, partition tolerant property, which is P. But now since Eric Boer theory is saying, you can only ensure two out of three properties can be guaranteed at, at, at simultaneous at one, one time. So either you choose uh, CP or you choose CA, a PA, PA, or only two out of three or CA. The, the banks choose CA, right? They don't care about partition tolerant. If there's a partition, they shut down the system right away. They guarantee consistency. And when the system is consistent, they open up, they, they make sure it's a scalable available. So decentralized system, as I just summarized, we need to provide people just either CP or AP. For the sake of Bitcoin, they provide this A and, a and P because Bitcoin want to be available all the time. And uh, they want to also allow a network to be partitioned, but they sacrifice consistency. As I again just mentioned, we think about six hours or half an hour, but depending on the situation, your transaction was in an inconsistent state. So double spending could happen. And uh, summarize Bitcoin's problem. One is uh, it's very expensive to maintain such a blockchain and $1 billion a year. And the lack of privacy, why? Because you put data on the chain. So now you say, Edward, are you kidding? You want to put medical data on the chain. So you want to put medical data in the public. So I will come back to address the issue shortly. And uh, use a POS, proof of work protocol, it means uh, you want to solve a puzzle and uh, nuance. It's very expensive. And uh, finally, low throughput, right? Transaction per second for Bitcoin is only seven transactions per second. And Ethereum is 15, not much better. So we, if we utilize that to be a payment, that's impossible. And if we want to utilize for security, privacy, preservation, that's kind of also not very convenient, but we can solve the problem. So banking, I talk about the centralized system using CA. And we also already discussed a trade-off between uh, centralized and decentralized uh, consensus protocols. And then let's look at Soteria. How can you implement a system which is at the same time can ensure this uh, AP, pro AP kind of property also can ensure uh, PC, I mean, PC and PA at the same time. So PC and PA, if you union the two, it can become PCA. The trick here is we want to be able to achieve short latency like one to two minutes and the super need to be extremely high. And uh, we are arguing, uh, this is actually argued by Professor uh, Majerus. Professor Majerus, by the way, uh, he was one of the founders of uh, uh, Stellar. Uh, Stellar already IPO'd, 
uh, is maybe number eight, uh, the pub, uh, public published company, public IPO company on blockchains. And uh, he he and us had many, many interesting debates. So basically I say, okay, let's have this two layer blockchain. So you have main chain ensures AP properties. In the worst case, main chain is Ethereum. It's in the public domain, but the side chain will be on the CA, using CA property, right? We are using uh, CP property is also okay. So the side chain will be very, very quick, but the main chain will be, be very slow. So this is the picture or side chain, let's say even using CA system, the main chain is using this, this uh, AP system. We organize them into three layers. The first layer is a public chain with very slow uh, response time and high latency. And the second layer with very fast execution time, low latency and high throughput. The method to improve throughput is like David Major said, you just replicate your CPU, right? You just improve, just duplicate your local system. And you, I only care about latency. You want to guarantee latency. Then when you want to guarantee throughput, if you have sufficient business, you just replicate your system. So that's a claim by Professor David Majerus, and we have to agree with him. And finally, you have this smart contract, which is the way to not to put data on the blockchain, but you put contract on the blockchain. Even more beautifully, the contract is in nature language. So if you say I put uh, uh, something on the blockchain, which is my private data, it's, it's really bad. If I put a digital contract, which is a piece of code on the blockchain, in fact, we will be eventually put a piece of code on the blockchain. Let's say I want to access your data, and this is an agreement in nature language, but we need to be able to convert this nature language statement to a piece of RESTful API or SQL statement, let's say, fetch something from relational database K with attribute equal to what, right? So with this particular piece of code, but already approved, then certain people can just execute the code to get your data. So smart contract is a very important piece of information sitting here for two reasons. One, through nature language, user can understand what they are up to. Then we convert the piece of uh, information into a piece of code. And this conversion, I pretty much covered when I talk about OVO, right? We had a lecture about this uh, uh, human voice speech interface. And in that, I talk about in OVO, and we need to do semantic grounding. Semantic grounding in principle is very challenging, but if you want to just ground into programs, it's much easier because programs only have a small number of instructions and also they are not ambiguous, right? In nature language, a word can mean multiple meanings, you have polysemy or other situations, but in code, when you say write, it's right. When you say move, it's move. So smart contract is the good solution. So smart contract summarize it. It's a piece of nature language construct to convert to a code. And the data is offline, retrieved by approved code. And the contract validation revocation execution will generate transactions. And these transactions will be written onto the blockchain. So when you look at the blockchain, you, you, you do see, oh, I have a piece of code executed, but the code number is 722, you have this ID, and uh, then you have uh, transactions to form a tree and uh, the root of the Merkle tree on the subchain, right? We say subchain will be very efficient, but you say, okay, I make the subchain very efficient, but the root of the Merkle, Merkle tree, I log it to the main chain. So when I lock the secondary root to the main chain, the process will suffer from low latency, but it's okay, right? Because I can locally guarantee uh, the transaction has been hardened, but probability can be done, can be guaranteed maybe half an hour later. So this is acceptable, acceptable to the private situation because even I want to sue a company, I cannot file a lawsuit within uh, within half an hour, right? So I do have half an hour. Probably if you want to contact a lawyer to file a lawsuit, that would probably take a few days. So 
this hierarchical architecture is just beautifully can accomplish the objectives. To summarize, we have this uh, on a side chain, we have hash blocks and they got, they got linked together and they enjoy the performance of high throughput because you can replicate the systems and more importantly, low latency. And the privacy is safeguarded because we don't store data on the blockchain. We only store uh, the ID of the code on the blockchain. Data is in the database access to the, the code. And then we hash the root of the local Merkle tree to the global uh, blockchain. So when the public auditing, when the public audit is, is conducted, they can go back to the global uh, global blockchain to verify the local Merkle tree hash value is not altered, right? This ensure authentic authenticity. So this picture just to complete. When we implement a system, we still need to have a reasonable user interface. If you like to know the details, you can look into our, our publication available uh, on the internet. Let me get into slightly more details. Uh, say on the left-hand side, right, you have interface here. Uh, both data consumer and data provider can access through the web and the data uh, provider, let's say I'm a patient. I can say, okay, I have a data, my X-ray. I'm willing to sell my data at the price. And data consumer comes, comes in to say, this may be a pharmaceutical company saying, I like to be able to bid uh, 20 pieces of data in that particular situation. Or I say, I want to do IRB. I want to do kind of some, some kind of drug discovery or, or vaccine test. I need to recruit 10, 10 million people or 10,000 people. I can go through the system to say, who willing to give me your vaccine, uh, drug interaction or side effect data. So then this agreement can be conducted uh, through the web application. So once uh, the consensus has been performed, then the data will be stored right into the uh, database. At the same time, the blockchain will be also locked on the blockchain. And then when the audit comes in, this, the bottom is the audit. Audit comes in, you can look into the local database, which caches the blockchain's information. And right away I can say, well, uh, the company already fulfilled your requirement and this is the information I can give you right away. And the response time for this ATS cache can be just within seconds. Then they say, no, I, I don't trust you. I want to go to the core to verify. Then the core will not access the company's private data here, storing the cache. The core will go to Solteria, which is a transparent public ledger and the court or auditor can go there to access the, all the transaction, transactional information. And this is a picture uh, thanks to Professor David Measures, Mon Mon Monica, and the Shui Liao in NTU. And we try many different local protocols and eventually uh, we identify Stellar and uh, Tendermint. Those are two uh, good protocols we can employ. It. And uh, uh, there's a very strong argument from Professor David Measures. He's a no nonsense guy. He said, why do you guys want to use blockchain? Because I can see this entire system can be implemented by a log only method. You just log, right? You just logging. Why do you need to ensure consistency in this whole thing? This is not payment. And we do have a very good counter argument. That counter argument uh, ceased uh, his concern. So if you have time to think about it, why we need to have consensus on consistency on the order of transaction in the privacy preservation scenario. Yeah, it's an interesting question to think about. Uh, so we uh, did some experiment we conducted, but the details uh, again refer to our publications. So summarize today's lecture, lecture. Privacy is very critical. If you started a company, you want to be able to consider privacy before IPOs, right? All the lawsuits wouldn't come in when you are a query company, but when you go public, the next day you see a, a number of uh, uh, a number of letters from lawyers and complex requirement and uh, also some solutions. They are complementary, right? You, you can use them in, in a combined method, but the ADM probability transparency, uh, they must be uh, safeguarded. And uh, with this uh, concludes today's 
lecture. Uh, you have questions, please ask on the Slack and uh, also remind you to sign up for your final uh, presentation. The final page here is the publications. So GDPR and uh, uh, CCPA, and finally this uh, Salteria uh, paper. So I see one question. Oh, you know, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, question, any questions? Okay, next year we are going to fix it, but next year we are going to have lectures live. So we can have much more engaged discussion. And uh, so thank you so much. Again, send your message or questions on the Slack, do the cost evaluation and uh, sign up for the presentation slots. Bye-bye. <laughs>